So it's somebody who goes to put his message or her message on top of another message, and it becomes a very layered communication, so a real-time forum. The second thing that I thought about City 2.0 was a real-time social network, because my uh, relationship to street art, and I think you could talk about that topic in many, many different ways, and I'm going to talk about it in a personal way, Mine was a kind of real-life social network. So when I first got to Europe, I would meet artists from many different countries who were traveling. And they all shared certain attitudes, and one was an attitude of generosity. They were really happy to open the door, to provide a meal, to show you around the city, to explore, to exchange. And in a way, it felt at first, like at the end of the 90s, like a very extensive, uh, strange family. Uh, that came together in this movement. So it was a real-time social network, and that's where I start thinking about City 2.0. I'm getting used to the clicker. Yeah, this isn't really part of my speech, but it's a nice example for me of street art. I don't know if any of you saw this, and you recognize the building, I guess. Yeah, maybe? Palais de Justice? Yeah? Okay. So that was a graffiti from, I don't know, six months ago, something like that. And I, I don't know where I stand on that exactly, but that's the kind of vandalism, that's the kind of like, you know, I claim a space and take it, and I go through a lot of risk to do it, that has to be part of the street art conversation. So for me, as a, as a stranger, as a foreigner living in Brussels, as a new, new Bruxelles, an immigrant here, really, I, I've never seen that building without scaffolding. And I, I've been here some time, so I know money is getting pumped into it all the time, and I know work isn't getting finished. And so on one hand, I want to hate the guy who does this, who vandalizes the one part that's finally finished. And on the other hand, frankly, I think he's a genius because he had a lot of courage to go up there and make a joke of what is kind of a joke, a construction that takes that long. Okay, but that was not the point of my talk. Still getting used to the clicker. All right, so what I, I do love, and now we're going to go back to another high image. What I really liked about seeing these images on the street, seeing street art in general, is that it, it taught me, it trained me in a way, to see my city differently. You know, so first there's the giving thing, like I talked about with the people I met, this gesture of giving. Second, it's how you see and how you read. Like this project, it's a Dutch artist called Jeroen Jungelein, and the project is called Plastic Bag as a Jolly Roger. And the Jolly Roger is the old anarchistic pirate flag with the skull and bones, right? And basically what he's doing is he's taking plastic bags that he finds on the street and he's hanging them. And he's hanging them in all kinds of places, from bridges, buildings, old parking lots, trees. And his practice is really physical. It's an explorer. He's climbing. He's looking into the city in different ways. But what it does for me, you see one of those bags and you don't think anything about it. It's just another piece of common urban trash, a kind of tumbleweed. You see two or three or four or five, and maybe you start to ask certain questions. Does it have a significance? Is it accidental? Who did that? What does it mean? And the answers to these questions don't matter at all for me. What matters is that you start to look up and to notice the top of the building there, or to notice the thing around the corner that you never saw before. You start to open your eyes to signifiers and communications in your own town. And this is the, the empowering thing. This is the thing that can make real transformation. So there we see a lot of street art. That's a wall in New York City on Spring Street. And I just want to use that image to say that at some point, you know, our cities are covered with it. And it's not just the cities anymore. Take the train throughout Belgium. And you're going to see some graffiti, some tags, some stencils, some poster everywhere. It's kind of the wallpaper now, and that's, that's something to think about. So going back to when I started thinking about it at the end of the 90s, the world was in a really different place, right? At least in the US, Bill Clinton was president. We hadn't had George Bush Jr. yet. The main political question was, did he and Monica get it on in the office, outside of the office? What's the stain on her dress? The world was to the left. We didn't imagine the things that were coming. We didn't imagine the economy dipping off. And what was going on? If I think about the end of the 90s, I remember the protests in Davos against the WTO. There were two or 3,000 people in the 97, 98. By 99, these protests in Seattle, what's called the Battle for Seattle, were nearly 100,000 people. So one, I think that the good state of the world led to the ability to protest, to be disobedient. And two, the technology that came at that time facilitated the mobilization of people who wanted to be involved in that. I would say street art is similar to those kind of 
those kind of protests. The other things going on at that time, I remember No Logo, if you remember the book by Naomi Klein, kind of shot to a bestseller immediately, because branding and globalization, these were the threats. The corporate impulse on our own desires, on our role as citizens and individuals, this was the kind of threat people were talking about. And in terms of technology, we also, of course, had Napster, the first peer-to-peer. And I'm going back now with this idea of peer-to-peer -to, -peer to this gesture of giving, a gift economy, and that's what I encountered with street art, was this sort of, I will give a sign in exchange for a sign, and it's an active conversation instead of a one-way drive to consume. This is a project from American called Mark Jenkins. It shows the sort of sweet violence that I, I did like uh, at that time about street art. He basically turned parking meters into lollipops. Um, so, you know, if you put your car there, you were really happy on a Saturday. This is a French artist called East Eric, and I just want to use that to show a little bit more the, the violent side, because I think this situation I talked about at the end of the 90s with street art and how that phenomena rose, it was also something that was very liberating because it was outside of the market. None of it was for sale. And while we looked around our cities and the whole kind of public visual landscape had images that were there to push us to consume, this one didn't. It was absurd and it was human. <coughs> And that made it the kind of right thing at the right time. And a lot of people were receptive to it for those reasons. Today, I think the situation has changed a lot. And, you know, the artists that I would talk to at the end of the 90s would say mainly two things in common. We want to make an art gallery that's open for the world, where you don't need a certain vocabulary or, or size of wallet to access it. Uh, and we want to compete with advertising. We want to compete with all these messages. But I think that within a decade, kind of what happened is that what started out competing with advertising became another form of advertising. And most of what we do see in street art these days, if it's somebody's name tagged over and over again, or their character, or you know, a nice fresque, often it's related to a product to sell or a direct message. So kind of this part of what it started out as, it's come full circle. It wasn't in the market. It wasn't for sale. It was something people chose to do for free, to give to you, to make a place better, more beautiful, and maybe to destroy it. That was their, their attitude. But now I think it is, it's in the market. It can't be denied. It might be selling a t-shirt or a poster, an idea, or a beautiful painting in a gallery, but it's commodified and it's changed. The first time I came to this center, for example, was to organize graffiti workshops. And that for me was amazing because it's an illegal practice. I mean, like, you know, this guy, East Eric, he's a French guy, and he is a vandal. He's an inventor. He's a great artist. He does beautiful things that give me that excitement, that give me that surprise. But at first, it seems kind of strange to invite a guy who's doing that to talk to your 10-year-old kids, right? And if we look at buying spray paint, go to the shop. It's, it's like the Boy Scouts. And this part of commercialization at first, I was a little bit cynical about it because I was young and I was idealistic. And for me, this is a very romantic discussion. Um, but I'm not cynical about that Boy Scout mentality anymore or that it is street art, it is something that belongs to branding. Because what I think is that these kids are learning to express themselves. They're learning creative skills, like they might have once learned survival skills. And I think creative skills are survival skills in the world that we live in. They're also learning to disrupt the system. Because while today, when we refer to this broad thing called street art, it is very much embedded in the system, it wasn't. And this, this is interesting. When the outsider movement becomes inside, as it gets passed on to another generation, something good can happen. Wow. Ten minutes went really fast. I'm just at the beginning. So this is East Eric, the French guy, again. And this was a workshop we did in Eindhoven. And I just wanted to illustrate the kind of vandalism that he does versus working with kids give them the tools. This was basically, you see, he taught them how to put paint into the skateboard with a pump so that you could paint as you skate. So it's again back to that sense of DIY, do-it-yourself, sustainability, and putting the creative tools in the hands of the youth. And I love that. In terms of marketing and advertising and how it's part of the system, this is on uh, the Land Lepagestraat, where I, I work in downtown Brussels. And you see it there. The first day people came, they said, beautiful, street art, great, take pictures, blog about it, tweet it, whatever. And I looked at it and I thought, well, the painting is bad. And what's this message about a girl in a shopping cart? Are we selling kids? I, I, don't, I don't get it. But people loved it. Next step, it gets other people to participate to it. Next step, you find out it's an advertisement from Toyota. And so Toyota has paid somebody to do something illegal and put it there. And now this rusted half shopping cart is sitting there on the street. 
and it's going to keep sitting there. And this raises a lot of questions about responsibility, because if you did that or I did that, we could get in trouble if the police saw us, and the police are too busy to care, fortunately. There's too much going on. But for me, that asks a lot of questions, why a company can get away with this kind of cheap abuse of my public space. That was right down the street, Martin Mergella. The rumor was, was it a campaign? It was a French artist who's hitting all big fashion places and then promoting himself as the guy who destroyed the fashion place. So it's again selling something. It's not, for me, this isn't part of change. It's a remnant, it's a trace of important changes that happened already. And this, as I've got 30 seconds left, is the kind of project I really love because it's a project that doesn't just put up a sign or a new signifier in public, it transforms it. This is the superhero project by an American artist called Abner Price, that's in Brussels. The basic idea, it's not pure street art. Maybe you remember the poster from the first slide. Uh, in this one, it's the artist who dresses up as a superhero, has his briefcase, artist going to work. What is his job? It's to screw you up a little bit. It's to transform how you see and how you live. So he's got in his briefcase not papers. Does it mean I have to stop? Maybe? Just go on? All right. So I'll keep going. So in his bag, he doesn't have his papers. He's not going to the bank. He's not a middle manager. He keeps going to work, and his job is to transform people. So when he first did this in Brussels, I thought it's never going to work. He walks around dressed like that with his bag full of costumes. And then he meets people on, the, on the, the metro or at the butcher or in the park. And he meets them sometimes because they laugh at him or they flirt with him or they insult him or they just look at each other. And as soon as there's a meeting, his power is to make you imagine yours. So he would stop people and he'd say, if you could be a hero, if you could have three powers, what would they be? Which was really interesting because people reflect on, I would, I would feed all the homeless. I would make a chef plan. Remember that word, right? That's what I would do with my power. I would cure cancer. I would fly. Or the most popular one, I would be invisible. And you learn a lot about how people see their civil responsibility in this kind of project for me. And then he actually dresses them up and makes them heroes. So we can see heroes he created, and you'll recognize some of the places, like that's the Vossipline, but that's Turkey, that's Ohio where I come from, that's Perugia. And now he's created like, I don't know, five, six hundred superheroes. And it's only for a minute, because like street art, it's ephemeral. It's not made to last. It's not part of the museum, it's part of the city. It's going to go away. But for a minute, people are super. And this is the kind of transformation and the kind of surprise that I loved about seeing a strange tag on my street or a strange face or picture. It's the same sort of feeling, but instead of going one punch, like a little girl in the shopping cart where you get it and you say, oh, great, this goes a little bit deeper. It's more committed and it's committed to real change and that's what I love about it. And this was the last slide because I thought maybe I wouldn't have enough things to say. This was a piece of street art in Brussels. It's a mattress, obviously. The mattress is made of cement, uh, though if you see it, it's cast so well, most people don't recognize that. And this was a Spanish artist who was referencing the real estate boom in Spain and then the subsequent collapse and how this has led to homelessness, people who can't pay their mortgage, austerity, job loss, and issues that are really affecting everybody across Europe right now. It's a 600 uh, kilo cement mattress that stayed in public space. And that's the last anecdote I'll tell, but I thought that was amazing. So we, we donated it to Brussels Helped, which was an organization, uh, event from Berska Berg and FM Brussel to raise money for three organizations working with SDF in, in, in Brussels. And they came to pick it up, but they forgot how heavy it was, I guess, and they didn't bring a truck. So we put it there, and my place is here, and there's a church, a Russian Orthodox church just next to it. And we left it overnight with a note about what it was for, etc. And um, the church didn't like it. And I, I came to work the next day, and there were 10 Russian guys around it, kicking off all the details, yelling at me. And I tried to explain to them that it was what it was for, what it was doing there, how it was going to help. And we, we had a, an art collector, a very generous man, who was going to give money to give to these organizations. And they destroyed all the detail, these guys. And the guy came to me, the collector, he said, I'm so, I'm so sorry, I can't pay for it now. And then I had to go to the police and say, I'm so sorry, I can't move it now. And so, like, this, this conversation that we had, I mean, it wasn't the one I would have liked. 
I didn't like that they destroyed it. I find it kind of sad. But this is what street art can do. And because they destroyed it, it stayed there for six weeks because we couldn't just move it. And as it stayed there for six weeks, every day people would talk about it. Why is it here? Why is it cement? Yeah, there's three homeless living there. Yeah, there were two there. Where did they go? And, you know, people in my neighborhood gathered around it and they spoke together about what they could do. And for me, that's, again, the, one of the best things art can do. It can be a catalyst that moves us, that shakes us up, and that makes us feel like we're able to transform our lives or our city. And uh, yeah, the clock's not running anymore. I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. Enjoy.